Okay, welcome everyone to the second lecture or act two of this year's Sliver lecture series called Temple Realities. Loud enough? Yeah. Okay. Uh, tonight we have the pleasure to welcome Jonas uh, Swinty Anderson and Simon Stroyer from Denmark. Uh, they are founders of Tightland, a creative practice operating out of Copenhagen. Their work sits at the intersection of temporalities and reality, as they could be framed as collectors of cultural and natural phenomena, and they utilize uh, architectural tools to turn abstract information into immersive experiences. And in doing so, they interlink architecture and environmental research with cutting-edge technologies of 3D scanning and fabricating. The temporal and the fluid qualities of space lie at the center of their work. And expressed as narratives, uh, they promote climate awareness through exhibitions, research, art in public space, and building interventions. Jonas holds a BA from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts and a Master from the Bartlett, while Simon graduated from the Roxilde University and Aho School of Architecture. In December 2022, Thailand Studio made the art dailies list of the 25 best practices in uh, 2023 as well as the Design's Top five, uh, 15 up-and-coming architecture practices in 2023. So, here we are. Although trained as architects, they also work as archivists of endangered spaces, as designers crafting immersive experience, as I mentioned already, and as narrators creating stories in order to bridge the gap, and here I borrow a quote from the eco-philosopher Timothy Morton, uh, Morton, and I quote, things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans, end of quote. Terrain plus water is the title of their lecture tonight, and without further ado, please welcome Thailand Studio. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for having us today. Um, we've really been looking forward to coming here. Um, um, it's our first time that we are lecturing in um, Austria, so yeah, so it's really fun to also get out of the city and yeah, get to share some of our thoughts and ideas um, yeah with you. Um, I actually prepared like a short introduction to um, Thailand Studio, but I think I already did a good uh, introduction. But just to um, give you uh, <laughs> um, give you an understanding of um, our thought processes and, and what we at Titan Studio are really interested about, um, and one of the topics that we are really engaged in um, is um, about um, some of the problems that we as a society um, have faced um, are yeah some of the challenges that we are facing um, as a human species um, and especially. Uh, things related to climate change, but also within politics, and and what we um, um, and why we are really interested in these topics is that or um, we wanted to see if we could use our background as architects to create spatial um, um, yeah sp sorry <laughs> spatial uh, I'm a little bit nervous sorry but <laughs> it's uh, way more people than I anticipated <laughs> so, um, but. Um, no, um, we wanted to see if we could create, use our um, background as um, architects to create spatial narratives around these topics and, um, and, our, and our interest in technologies to use those, um, use the new opportunities that the technologies hold to um, investigate um, and communicate um, um, yet, yet these problems. Um, and I guess we were really fascinated by um, when we initiated the company, or when we had the initial discussions about the 70s radical architecture um, and super studio, where they did these collages of how our um, yeah, world would maybe look like in the future, and we thought there was an opportunity to use um, yes, the new types of spatial technologies also to um, take these worlds um, that are created in 2D and take them out into the physical world to activate new senses and new ways of discussing these problems. So Thailand Studio was founded on this idea that we wanted to create a space where we could go out and really experience and investigate the, 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 the topics and, um, that we are really interested in and also um, go back into the, um, 
go back into the lab and explore how we can communicate or translate these uh, findings um, um, with the use of digital technologies. And I guess um, whenever we engage into a project, whether it's commissioned or if it's self-initiated, there's always these three legs that all of our um, projects um, yeah, stand on, which is this uh, idea of the holistic sustainability, the problems, climate change, it could be material related or political issues, combining that with technology, and then also looking at um, how we can corroborate a way of storytelling so that it engages um, other kinds of senses than just um, and than just our side. And I think that brings us into today's lecture, um, which we call Terrain and Water. Um, and I think we were inspired by the theme of, of this lecture series, the temporal realities. And we were looked at um, what is the what does it stand for, the movement, the time, the changes, and where do we find inspiration um, in our works um, is often in nature um, and in the terrain and water. And it also has inspired our studio so much that it actually um, is incorporated in the way that we explain or like uh, named our studio. So Thailand is this space um, that is in between land and water, um, and, and as you can see quoted here, it's a land that is alternatively exposed and covered by the ordinary ebb and flow of the tide. So it's a place that is in constant change, in constant movement, um, it's a, 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 and it's, it's happenings that are happening on a local scale, but it's also a local place that is connected to something global. So, and in this case, it's the connection to the movement of the moon. So, we are really interested in, whenever we engage into projects, is thinking about both lo local movement, but also how do, the, do these movement apply to a global scale. Um, I think especially when we look at Corona, we saw how interconnected our world was. So, that could be an example of that. Um, and I think this in interest in movement, in change, in time, came from our own studies. Um, and when we were taught architecture uh, on our bachelors, it was very much this idea of um, a building being this finished product that wouldn't change or wouldn't um, um, be different um, once it was built. And um, also the way that we learned to draw was these very static ways of thinking. Um, but whenever we looked elsewhere into other um, other fields, in this case it's science, um, the way that we describe our world is often through timelines. Um, this is um, a description of the Big Bang, um, and also in history, the timeline of um, how our society evolved to where it is today. And even when we talk about the challenges that we are facing, it's also um, an idea, um, it's also described through a timeline. But um, and we were really curious, and I think this curiosity started already in our studies about how and what happens if we, when we start to add these, these notions of time um, and these questions of movement and change into the built environment. Can we imagine a world where um, buildings um, move um, or grow like a tree or the facade changes just like the leaves? Um, and what happens to our architecture when we start to add this fourth dimension into the built environment? And I think these are some of the questions that we are really um, fascinated by at the moment um, and invest uh, and try to look at in many different ways. Um, um, and that, that brings us to how do we actually work with time. Um, earlier this year we were asked by Copenhagen uh, Architecture Festival to unfold, or like as the topic saying, unfold time and how do we use time to look um, at some of the challenges that we as a society are facing right now. Um, and with the use of time can um, think about alternative realities or ways of engaging with these problems to come up with different solutions that we normally would think of. And whenever we engage with time, we don't think about time as a linear uh, construct, but as um, notions of time, as a minute, as a day, as a year, all the way up to a millennium. And what we like to do is to ask these quest ask questions to different notions of time to see what kind of answers it can give. So it could be, for example, how would a building, what would a building look like if it was only supposed to last one minute or one day, and compared to a thousand years, it gives completely different answers and completely different ways of engaging with the architecture. Um, and this goes both both ways, I guess. Like we have, um, we look, look, use this both looking at the past but also into the future. Um, 
And this was basically the basis for um, for our um, answer to Copenhagen's Copenhagen Architecture Festival's proposal or um, unfolding. That we we ended up creating three stories that each told um, that each took a problem that we have here in society right now um, and looked at them from a from a time scale that we as um, that we normally don't associate with with this uh, problem. So this this first um, the first narrative that we um, that we uh, um, that we, we we ended up creating three narratives. Yeah, that was it. the first narrative that we created um, was um, this um, this idea about how does a city um, how does a city look like if it's only supposed like if it um, only if it changes its layout every day, um, and um, and it ended up becoming this story about. Um, uh, a, a person, like to give you an idea of how this story unfolded, um, I quickly want to read up a small bit from the from the story it itself um, to yeah, give you an understanding of it. Um, so yeah, he put down his cup and looked up um, out the window. A fantastic view, undisturbed, overlooking the sea. The window had followed the path uh, of the sun from one corner of the living room across the wall and was positioned at the bottom of the wall framing the orange sun, hanging right above the sea surface. It was his favorite view, and he always looked forward to the days um, when the neighboring houses gradually moved aside to make room for this. The house had uh, made sure that, um, they could um, enjoy the view for the last week before his daughter moved out. Martin thought it was a good idea. Um, and as the story tries to depict is um, what, um, what happens if um, elements in our rooms can start to move and later on in the story it's also about um, um, rooms moving around um, and questions about how can we live in if we were really interested about this question of how can we live in a city in the future um, and live more densely packed in cities in the future and share the spaces that we have um, available so, um, and applying a kind of an AI on top of the city, what would happen with, um, could we share our living rooms in our apartments when we were not home, so the neighbor could borrow the living room to have a yoga class, um, and, and so on, and yeah, and that's, yeah, and then um, the story started to unfold. Um, a second quest, uh, the second story was about, um, in, a, in, the, in some time in the future, um, we, um, when, um, we wanted um, when sea level rise was like more prominent than it is today. Um, we looked at this um, idea of like what is happening. Um, how can you um, looked at a scenario in Venice where we were interested in? Um, can you create a temporal version of Venice um, so that the city could um, move out of the city to deal with these um, sea level rise um, problems? Um, and here, the, and this temporal city was only supposed to last for about um, a couple of months. And then the idea was that um, um, some of the questions that arises from, from this narrative is suddenly that when you create a temporal city that is created by inflatable uh, pictures here, the images, um, what, is the, what is the type of, how, what does it mean to live in these type of materialities um, as, um, as as um, as inflatables um, are proposing, um, so and questions like um, it's really good to resist water, but also um, um, when when all the walls are filled with air, suddenly um, sound becomes a um, becomes a problem. And when you talk about a city um, from the perspective of um, a couple of months. Um, it's it's instead of talking about how do we share the spaces, it's suddenly a lot about questions, a lot about materiality and how how is the way of living with these materialities um, and what does it mean? And the last uh, narrative we ended up creating was um, um, was um, sometime in the far future, um, we wanted to see what does it take to build a building that takes a thousand years to build. Um, and what is some of the scenarios um, and some of the political questions that um, suddenly comes to mind when when you talk about timescales that are longer than a one human lifetime? So how do you ensure that a, um, that you can create a building um, 
um, and make sure that people 500 years into the future are still interested in building this building and it, become a, it becomes a lot about communication but also how to ensure that for example the finances um, and I think this also tries to give this idea of um, uh, um, that when you suddenly talk about building buildings on a large uh, time frame, it's, um, the question is maybe less about materiality suddenly, but it's more about the political um, inv investments that we, um, uh, yeah, political issues or uh, questions that comes up to mind. And um, Simon and I, for this lecture, we try to, because um, working with time can be extremely hard to understand and uh, really, un like, intangible um, so we try to place um, where our projects kind of um, align in these timelines to give you an idea of where we um, where these projects um, yeah, unfold themselves to also see if we could somehow make time more tangible yeah. <clears throat> so the um, project uh, was um, where, was one of one in which you could say was was one of the first where where time or the time scale the timeline became a really uh, um, crucial part of the design in a sense. So at the edge of the shadow is a is a speculative um, architecture project uh, and a research project about dark tourism inside the, the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant zone um, and um, to to uh, to, to start it off, uh, I think one of the things that we were fascinated with was uh, the idea of the, the sublime. Um, this is a, a, a painting by Caspar David Friedrich, and uh, it, it is often used in, 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 in relation to the sublime. And I think a fitting uh, definition of, of that is a greatness uh, beyond all possibility of calculation, measurement, uh, or imitation. Um, it is a feeling of, of awe, but also of, of terror, uh, and in that sense, I think it was a, it was an interesting um, way to, to enter this uh, this this uh, space um, where the this feeling of awe and terror uh, has to do with time. It has to do with with uh, with, with times and and and. Uh, yeah, time scales and, and, and physical scale that, uh, that is hard to, to comprehend. This uh, chain reaction happening in, in, in the core and explode an explosion spreading from, from the reactor out into the landscape, out into the region and then across um, most of Europe. So this, what we're looking at here is a, is a timeline that is uh, based on half-lives of radioactive materials. So those, uh, the, the ones that were spread in the explosion was iodine, cesium and plutonium, which have half-lives of, of 9 days, 30 years and 500 years. Um, so here we, we unfold these events through these different timelines and of course as we go into the timeline of the, the plutonium, uh, it becomes really abstract because then we, we talk about uh, landscapes that are, that are toxic for, for, uh, for thousands of years. And, and what does that look like? Uh, I mean, this, this might come, uh, come close to it, like looking out uh, into, into the abyss in some way. Um, it, it, um, it, it's, it, it sort of escapes uh, our, our comprehension. And, and radiation itself is, is, uh, is a strange thing. Uh, looking out uh, over Pripyat here, uh, you could say it's potentially everywhere, and it is uh, it is nowhere. When we look at uh, the, when we walk around in the landscape, um, there is this feeling that some places it sort of lingers. Uh, it, it's 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 invisible but almost tangible force. Uh, at least it feels that way um, when when we when we walk around in in, in this in these um, in these spaces in these. Uh, uh, environments, but in reality, there is only one way that we can really begin to to see this uh, this this hidden uh, layer in the landscape, and that becomes uh, so, and, and that is through the Geiger counter. So the Geiger counter is sort of our lens through which we we begin to to map the area, 
and uh, it becomes quite clear uh, uh, eventually that that, uh, that that radioactive particles they are they are uh, carried by the wind, by the water, by sediments. So in that sense, when we follow the movement of matter, we also follow the movement of the radiation. And <clears throat> in this way, the, the radiation sort of becomes spatial. Um, and this became the basis for, for, for some early explorations, uh, spatial explorations that, that, uh, that, that uh, of, of how we could use architecture sort of like an instrument, in this case, an instrument for visualizing radiation, an architectural Geiger counter, you could say. Um, the project was in, in was a hotel inside the zone, um, and our approach to sort of uh, place it in the landscape and, and, and make it uh, um, um, yeah, yeah, put it into this, this context was inspired by looking at, at uh, these cloud uh, or bubble chambers. Um, this, this photo on the left is from uh, CERN, um, where we see these, uh, the way that, that, that the radioactive particles are traced through these, uh, these bubble chambers. So each line is of these small bubbles that, that show the, tr the track of, of particles. And the building itself lies in the landscape in the same way, uh, moves in the landscape and acts as a sort of funnel, you could say, that catches the wind. Um, and, and in that sense, it's sort of uh, the, the radioactive uh, particles uh, that are still um, uh, invisible, but carried uh, by the wind uh, together with all of these other uh, dust particles, they sort of, uh, they, they build up over time, um, settles in those uh, places where the building turns, um, and, and, and over perhaps uh, decades, this, uh, the, 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 you could say the particles remain invisible, but, but, but the algae that, that, uh, that, that grow and the dust that, that settles on the, on the facade uh, becomes this, um, yeah, you would call it like a, a radioactive ornament. Um, so placing this on, on our uh, on, on our timeline, uh, the building itself demands a sort of patience, working at, at a timeline of, of decades um, to make this this invisible force. Um, uh, tangible on a, on a bodily level um, and on a different scale we have the the, accident, the the Chernobyl accident itself which like Chernobyl it, it is presents an extreme environment in this case but not solely due to the radiation but but because of these these uh, like vast uh, time scales and, and and spatial scales which which reminds us of of uh, of, of, uh, of another uh, issue um, that has to sort of this, these uh, same sublime dimensions, um, climate change, and and sometimes I, I guess what what we took what we took away from this project is this this idea that sometimes the things that we can comprehend intellectually um, they might be understood on a bodily level, uh, and I think that's one of the you could call it the superpowers of of, uh, of architects is that the language that we, that we speak is directly to the body um, and in that sense we might be able to communicate some of the themes that or some of the problems that, that are hardest to understand. So Chernobyl was sort of our gateway into this idea of working with technology as a way to enhance our senses and to re reveal uh, what is hidden and over time this, this turned into this ongoing research that we call radical sensibility. So in Chernobyl the Geiger counter uh, was a way to, to look at the landscape, to, to, to look at these layers of information. And uh, in radical sensibility we look at, at other technologies that, that, that might do the same or, or give us some, some other perspectives. In this case 3D scanning is something that we've, we've used uh, um, a lot lately. 
um, which have, of course, a, a, a clear application in architecture. But we also just fascinated by the origins in like forensic investigations to analyze accidents or um, uh, scenes of, of, uh, of violence. And it's obviously about capturing this snapshot and quickly getting all the details that you can. I send, uh, we sent some students out into uh, Aarhus University, um, the, this, this uh, vast uh, basement underneath the, the university building, um, and, and gave them this uh, task of, of, of creating some interesting perspectives on, on this building that, you, that, that people would not, not normally see. And I think, um, and I think this, as a sort of almost like a, a, the precision of a medical tool that, that some that, that some three D scanners have, um, the building becomes this this uh, or, or the scan becomes this X ray through the body of the building, revealing some of, of these uh, impossible perspectives that are just really fascinating. So we see these these layers upon layers of of stored things and like forgotten objects that are um, like uh, old building materials from when the building was, was built, um, like entirely uh, rooms that, that are sort of uh, hidden or forgotten underneath the, the main auditorium here. And, and the students were also really fascinated with, with, these, uh, with this uh, archaeological, this little archaeological museum. Um, that was, uh, uh, yeah, underground. Also, yeah, storing uh, a lot of, of copies of, of famous um, sculptures from, from the antiquities. So, you could call this like a fascination with this uh, forensic pathology. And this becomes even more apparent um, in, in this next project. Um, where we, we, we have this, uh, this forest in, in, in Denmark with like, these beautiful old oak trees, like uh, living, oak, living oak trees that are up to 2,000 years old. Um, and uh, while some of them are still alive, this one is, uh, is dead. It's a 700-year-old seven, tree that we return to every year to, to scan and uh, and, and to see how it sort of uh, returns to the landscape like uh, quite slowly. And um, these, these trees are dying at the moment because the, the owner of this, the forest is draining it uh, to create a more efficient uh, forestry. So in a sense, it is, it is also like a, a form of a crime scene here, you could, you could say. Um, and I think it's really fascinating to look at trees and the way that we look at buildings. Like this is a very architectural thing to do, like a, a section, uh, a plan section uh, through this uh, this tree. We see the trunks uh, of the tree that that lies on the that that lies uh, next to the um, next to the tree, and sort of uh, are becoming one with the earth. But also, what is really interesting in this this picture that we didn't like see when we went there is this perfect circle around the tree um, coming from this like uh, almost a, a ritual where people visiting the trees they walk around the tree and over time it sort of it, it creates this uh, indentation in the in the ground and uh, I just think it, it says a lot about our relationship to trees um, because like these trees are not, it's not a coincidence that these trees have, have gotten this old because forestry has, has always happened in, in this forest. So through these 700 years, through generations of, of, uh, of, um, of foresters, they have, stand, they have uh, been standing there next to the tree and then with their axe in the hand and then they decided not to, not to cut this, uh, this specific tree down because there was something special about it. And I just think, uh, that's uh, that's interesting, and also like how this this circle is now uh, uh, broken. Um, so we're fascinated by these uh, 
at the moment these trees, these Danish forests, uh, working on a, a small uh, film um, where we collect stories about trees, like personal stories about trees, combining them with these uh, 3D scans uh, and data visualization to create this archive of, of more than human uh, narratives. And I think when I just think that something really fascinating uh, happens when we when we look at this on, the, on a time scale, where we measure uh, human human lives in, in decades and trees tree lives in in, in centuries. Um, perhaps you could say that uh, if we really wanted this uh, earth to uh, to thrive, then uh, we should we, we should maybe. Um, move our our focus to 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 the timeline of uh, of other species and I think um, radical sensibility was actually um, and the the tools and the technologies that we unfolded in that project was the initiation point of the next project we want to uh, unfold for you today and which we call archive of endangered spaces an archive of endangered spaces is an ongoing research project where we are really interested in capturing spaces that are due to disappear um, um, within the next 100 years due to climate change. And we want to try to see if we could capture these spaces using um, some of these technologies um, into an archive so people that in the future can maybe go back and re-experience um, the spaces that are um, disappearing. Um, Archive of Endangered Spaces is also an investigation and a speculation of what is and what is the, how does the what is the archive of the future, um, and, and what um, and how should such an archive look like? Um, and for this archive, the first file or the first place that we wanted to capture um, was um, was the glaciers in Svalbard, um, and Svalbard is the reason why we chose Svalbard is that it's the the northernmost um, permanently inhabited place on Earth, but it's also one of the places on Earth where climate change is, is experienced the most. Just in the last 30 years, um, the uh, median um, winter temperature has risen by um, seven degrees. That you see very clearly when you look at old pictures from um, from Svalbard and then compare them to pictures that were taken um, just a couple of years ago. And here we see the glaciers that are yeah, disappearing. And we were really curious about if we could um, go up there and um, capture these glaciers, but also see if we could find similar traces in the environment um, of the, of the um, melting of the ice. Um, but we were also, um, for this archive, really interested in um, how does these changes actually affect um, how the human population are, um, um, and the people that are living on Svalbard um, are experiencing these changes. And here we are speaking with uh, one of the people that we sp spoke with, which is Natalia Mashinko, who is a researcher at uh, the Svalbard University and also um, applies 3D scanning into Arctic environments and um, especially into the built environment. Um, and she also told it, showed us how um, structures and the whole city is starting to move because of the thawing of the permafrost that the, that the city is built on. And this also applies to roads, um, and here is the airport. And when we walked around inside of uh, the city, we could also experience these changes um, having effect on the build, build environment up there, um, structures collapsing or um, buildings being taken over by the, um, by the nature. Um, and we were really curious about, is it possible to find similar traces out in the nature? Um, so, um, so we decided to go out and see, look at the glaciers from a lot of different perspectives um, using 3D scanners, uh, standing 3D scanners, drones, handheld 3D scanners. Um, here we are sitting in front of a glacier wall that is 200 meters away from us, um, flying a drone. This is 10 minutes later where our drone, uh, our drone broke down um, because of the cold um, wind. Um, so we were working in temperatures of minus, minus 20 degrees, which meant that a lot of the electronics that we brought to these really extreme environments um, had a really hard time. We also managed to break a 100,000 euro uh, 3D scanner because the motor froze. Um, 
So um, there was like it's, it was it, um, there was something about the patience and understanding the landscape when we worked in it. Um, here we are seeing um, the uh, moraine ice, which is from mountain glaciers in, at the very front. This is some exposed ice that are um, really really old ice um, that is exposed now. Um, also, um, ice from from the glaciers that is broken off and captured by captured by the frozen sea ice that we could come close to, and this is a frozen waterfall, basically the melting water from the mountain glaciers captured um, in this transition from summer to winter. Um, um, this is the um, uh, water from the from the river bed, but we also went into the glaciers and looked at the meltwater channels inside of the glaciers. Um, looked at um, um, the meltwater in these channels that that freezes in this transition from winter uh, from summer to winter, and even the ice crystals, um, and scanned it all. And one of the places where we experienced these changes the most um, was actually inside of the meltwater channels. Um, and a meltwater channel um, inside of the glaciers um, are formed every year um, from when when the surface of the glaciers melt and then um, the water kind of carves its way through the glacier and creates these, um, creates these spaces that we as humans then can access in winter. Um, and, and what we see here, this, this particular uh, meltwater cave, uh, meltwater channel we were inside, um, um, we went 400 meters underneath the glacier um, yeah, to capture it all. Um, and I think one of the um, I think one of the things that we talked a lot a lot about and that made a huge impression on, on us when we came back home was that it's probably been one of the most alienating uh, places on Earth that we have ever been to. But at the same time, um, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, alienating places uh, on Earth, um, and maybe also one of the most disconnected places where we hadn't been this far away from society. There was no connection to any cell phones, and so on. And if our guide died, or yeah, we would <laughs> we wouldn't know how to get home. Um, so. Um, um, but at the same time, we, when we were sitting inside of this meltwater channel, we still felt a kind of a connection to humans, um, and we were speculating if um, the activities of humans have actually, actually um, made its way all the way to this cave, and if this cave was some kind of uh, fusion architecture where nat natural processes and human activities um, with climate change had made it possible for us to enter this space. And to really get an understanding of what we were working with, we decided we 3D scanned the, the full uh, extent of the cave, a process that it took us around four, five hours uh, to complete. And we ended up getting this uh, data set with us, along with all the other um, places that we were, uh, that we scanned. And when we come back home, one of the challenges that we were facing, uh, faced with was how do we depict scale in these, um, in these captions? Because um, when we walked around in, on Svalbard, there wasn't any markers in the landscapes as we are used to um, um, from here in Europe, where we, when we walk around in the landscape, we have a tree, we have a building, so we kind of get a spatial relationship to how far away the landscape is or how big something is. So one of the first challenges that we put ourselves was how do we um, apply scale or, um, to, these, um, to the 3D scans that we had made. Um, and some of the initial tries was trying to add height maps to to the Melwater channel to see if we could uh, unfold um, yeah um, space, the sizes of the spaces. Um, but we also tried to do some architectural exercises. Here we tried to apply um, sections throughout the whole um, um, Melwater channel and put a small body. So if you can see down down here, there's a, there's a human. Um, that is uh, kind of giving a spatial relationship to how big these spaces that we had scanned um, was. And what we ended up getting was this um, catalog of, um, of humans and nature united um, in a library, I guess. Um, but for non-architects, it can maybe be really difficult to understand um, the scale of a section. So we also wanted to explore, can we um, take some of these scans and recreate them in real life and, and what would that mean? So we took a section of the Millwater channel and recreated it one to one and down in the left corner, if you can see it, you can kind of see um, the size of this, um, this one to one model. 
So it was three meters high, two meters wide, and then one meter in depth. Um, so that other people also could experience the experiences that we had experienced um, in the Millwater Channel, but also it was an exercise to see if we could activate other senses um, in this model here, the side or the touch, instead of only using the side. And one of the things that we um, also suddenly came out when we did this one-to-one um, -one model, of which was it was a large-scale 3D print, um, was that. Um, that we saw um, time suddenly unfold itself in the surface of the, the Millwater channel. Um, and we, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but down in the left corner there is these lines of um, years. So every year the Millwater come, um, cuts its way through the Millwater channel to a certain point, then it freezes and then the same process happened um, the year after. And, um, and that became an interest to how do we unfold time in these, um, in these scans that we had created um, and show the seasonal changes in the Millwater Channel um, um, yeah, carving its way through the um, surface of, of these Millwater Channels to the decades that the, it takes for the Millwater to form um, and all the way up to the thousand of years it takes to recreate or like to create, takes to create these um, huge glaciers um, um, that are found on Svalbard. And time became also um, um, something that we wanted to investigate, um, how would the glaciers look like in the future? And here we did a collaboration with Mighty, an artist uh, based in Paris, where um, we wanted to see how our Millwater channel um, could, um, would look like um, 500 years in the future, when, um, or like through time, when the, when the ice would um, slowly start to melt. And what Mighty was really interested in is what type of creatures are inhabiting or are frozen into the glacial walls and will suddenly um, come out of the ice when, as the ice is moving. So as you walk through this VR experience, um, the spaces, spaces slowly open up and these creatures slowly evolve and become more and more dominant. dominant. Um, Archive of Endangered Spaces was, or this first file of Svalbard was an experiment on how we could capture spaces and um, save them for future generations. But it was as well um, a, a, um, an exercise or an experiment on how can we um, scan these places and create communication um, um, around landscapes that are endangered in the future. And these are some images um, of different places where we're really fortunate to exhibit this project, where we try to um, unfold these notions of scale and time um, in the exhibitions. Um, and to sum it up, it's, it's about how these, um, um, the archive is somehow um, capturing these spaces that have been created over and mil and mil uh, thousands of years, and then um, into an archive that is um, we want um, that that um, yeah we want to see like for an archive that is supposed to outlast us as um, humans or like uh, our time scale. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... yeah, New Arc is an um, is is a project where we work with with this. Uh, with, with time as a, as a narrative tool, very uh, directly, you could say. Um, it's a collaboration with uh, the studio Rumgehör and, uh, and uh, a visual artist, Aya Rose Solvan. Um, it's located in, in Aarhus, next to uh, Denmark's new architecture school. Um, and this is the site. Uh, at least that's how it uh, looked 120 years ago. It was this uh, beautiful, flooded, natural landscape where the river met the city. Um, but as all who started to grow, there wasn't room for the for the river. So the river was moved, and this uh, this area was completely drained uh, to make room for uh, for the growing city and this uh, freight station that um, that take that took up the the area. Um, and as uh, Aarhus is a coastal city, uh, like like most other coastal city, it's uh, it it uh, it doesn't take too much um, imagination to, uh, to 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 see that uh, at some point the this uh, forgotten um, water landscape, or this forgotten river, uh, will return. Uh, we see our site 
here in, in the middle, one of the lowest uh, points in, in Aarhus. So, um, this, is, uh, this is the site, it's around, uh, uh, it's, it's like a, a, a pretty narrow passageway between on the one side uh, private housing and on the other uh, the architecture uh, school uh, to the right. And it's also a, a strange space in the sense that it's, it's sort of dark and it is like a backside to the school. Um, so, but it is an important place for people to, to walk through on their way uh, through, through the city. Um, so it has its uh, potentials and it, it has its uh, challenges. And what we wanted to do was to bring the water back to the area, uh, both to to remind people of, of uh, the importance of the river in uh, in Aarhus and, and the water that used to be, and of and, and also of like the, the beauty and the destructive quality uh, of of water. So this study took us uh, in, in different directions, but we we were especially fascinated by this uh, intersection between like the science of wave dynamics. Uh, on the one hand, and this phenomenological um, experience uh, of water, which uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci um, captured uh, beautifully in, in the, the sketches on the, on the left. So the idea was pretty simple. Uh, we travel around 100 years into the future, uh, where this uh, area is flooded. Uh, and from the roofs of the architecture school, we, we throw out these life rings um, that are scaled up uh, four times. And then we watch how these uh, ripples um, spread on the, on the surface. And of course, this, uh, this idea wasn't as, as simple uh, to actually uh, to, do, to do this performance. Um, it took a lot of uh, testing. Um, and I think like we, we worked with a we we talked with a, a, a Danish robotics company who, uh, who who we wanted to help us to produce the actual uh, tiles, and they were like this uh, cannot be done. The geometry is too heavy. Uh, the detail wouldn't be uh, good enough, and uh, can, it, it's it wouldn't be possible to do within the budget and all this. Um, so to in order to actually. Uh, do the idea or uh, to to validate the idea, we had to do these prototypes ourselves uh, that we uh, could do on the on the school of uh, of architecture, um, and uh, over time they were also like fascinated with, with this challenge of creating these uh, these tiles. Um, so they they took on the the job to to make these uh, casts and um, and and these are all like one. We chose to do 100, one times one meter uh, tiles, in, um, and then casting concrete onto the onto the molds that were CNC. Um, and and what we're looking at here is, uh, yeah, the final in install. And three months ago, it was uh, opened, and and this is sort of what it, it uh, looks like uh, today. And. What I really uh, like is how I think to a lot of people we we've, we've talked to is like how they when they when they sort of go around and explore this space they get an understanding of something that that most of us might take for granted like the, the this fascinating complex uh, dynamics of, of water usually see I think um, the, we, we scaled up these uh, life rings to a size where it also becomes this, this uh, furniture that people, people can so, uh, seek rescue on um, as the storm is, uh, or the, yeah, the flood is coming. Um, and in a way, it also like this, this space became something like the, the qualities of the challenges of the space became uh, a, a positive thing because. All of a sudden, like you had to move across these uh, tiles, and the way that it, that it feels under your under your feet um, creates this uh, 
this, I think, quite fun relation between like the movement of the body and the movement of the water. And so you become very conscious of your walking. And in that sense, like using this long passage as a, as a way to, to, uh, to create a mindful uh, walk through the city, I think uh, in that sense it, it works quite well. And the rings, they also uh, bring like the sky down into the space. So even though it is a little bit dark at some points of, of day, I think uh, they, they bring some light down. And then of course, they also help to to distort this very modernistic uh, grid that is both in, that is, is especially in the new uh, architecture school. So you could say that this was like a very specific timeline, 200 years uh, in from, uh, yeah, a timeline of, of 200 years, past and present, uh, connected through this one minute digital uh, performance. And I think, uh, like looking at, it was a really fun exercise to to actually do this uh, this plotting our ideas or projects into this uh, this timeline. I think definitely something that we see as a as a creative tool that um, maybe others will also uh, um, it, it might also be be helpful to others to work uh, with the timeline as this this uh, this tool moving uh, ideas or, uh, around on the, on the board or sort of like uh, puzzles, uh, pieces of a puzzle, I think it can, uh, it can, it can, um, it can do something um, interesting. Um, and to tie it together with the, 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 the title of uh, our talk, um, I really like this, uh, this quote. Um, yeah, water is fluid, soft and yielding, but water will wear away rock which is rigid and cannot yield. As a rule, whatever is fluid, soft and yielding will overcome whatever is rigid and hard. This is another paradox, what is soft is strong. And I think, like it might be that the, the further we uh, like when we stand on this, uh, like in the in the painting um, by Caspar David Flitwick, we, we can imagine that the further we sort of gaze out into the future, uh, the softer our focus become. But but even so, like when when we as architects, uh, with with all our creativity and imagination, when we begin to project this out into the future, I think it uh, it we also um, shape it. Um, just like water shapes the terrain, not through uh, force, but through time. Um, right now we are trying to maybe build ourselves out of this, uh, this crisis, and perhaps uh, you could say that the biggest obstacles need to, uh, to be approached with uh, softness. And uh, I think that, uh, that concludes it for us.